Good morning. This is Pastor Janet Floyd. Welcome to the Sunday morning worship service of the New Beginnings Worship Center. You just stepped into a life-changing experience. So good to have you with the, have you with us this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we should rejoice and be glad in it. Remember, we've said, despite all the devil is doing in our country, in our world, and even in our lives, God has done, praise God, exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever ask or think. And so we've decided. Remember, we've talked about all year long making a decision. We've decided to rejoice. To rejoice is a choice. And this morning, once again, we choose to rejoice. It's so good to be with you today. For those of you that live here in Monroe, Louisiana, we're located at 1932 Winsboro Road in the heart of Southside, Monroe, Louisiana. And for those of you that are with us via Facebook and different social media platforms, you are with us right here. And it's so good to be with you. I've been waiting to talk to you. Oh, listen, I want to encourage you about millennial prayer tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. I want you to know these young people have been going down to the enemy's camp. Everyone 40 and younger, you don't want to miss this extraordinary experience. The Bible encourages us to train up our children in the way that they should go. So when they're old, they won't depart. I want to encourage you, parents and leaders and pastors and mentors, we are not, praise God, working with the church of tomorrow. This is the church of today. And so we want to, amen, teach them the way of prayer. We want to, praise God, Teach them, amen, the import of having communication, having discourse with God. We want to teach them the dying art of intercession. It happens at 5 a.m. Central Standard Time, 6 a.m. Eastern Time, 4 a.m. Pacific Time, and 3 a.m. Mountain Time. You've got to join us. And those of you that are younger than 40, excuse me, older than 40, such as I am, come on and help us pray. Come on, help us press our way. Come on, help, amen, help them, praise God. Let's help the younger people, and let's train them. Let's together go down to the enemy's camp and take back what he took from us. And then on Tuesday morning, I will be in prayer with you. I'll be on the line. We're going down to the enemy's camp Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. The Bible said to this end, men are always to pray and faint not. I want you to know there is the only exercise that will change people and places and things to is prayer. There is no thing. There's not anything that prayer cannot change. And there's not anyone who prayer can't change. So I want to encourage you. I'll be on the line Tuesday morning. I believe that'll be December 15th. I'll be on the line. I want to lead you. I'll be praying with you. And for those of you that have prayer requests, please send in your prayer requests. I won't mention your name unless you ask me to unless you make a request but those of you that have praise reports oh not only do we want to pray with you we want to praise God with you so please contact us let us know if you have a prayer request and let us know if you have a praise report amen we are in the middle of our 28 days of decision I promise you I'd be walking with you every single day you need to praise God amen go on Facebook and look every day God's giving me a word of wisdom remember every problem is a wisdom problem there is not anything in your life that wisdom cannot praise God amen give you the solution to or the answer to and so every Every day, every single day, Saturdays and Sundays, every day of the week, there's a word from the Lord and you want to, amen, be there to receive that word. Right now, we're getting ready to go into the word of God. Right before we go, let's pray. Great God of the Bible, we bless you this morning. And we thank you for a day that we've never seen. Father, it's a day that you do not owe us. And certainly it's a day that we do not deserve. We are thankful to you. Father God, we've always said someone's gone that was here just yesterday. But God, in these times when the coronavirus is sweeping across our country, certainly, Father God, it is reality. Someone's gone that was here just yesterday. And Father God, we know that the word said, blessed are they that die in the Lord because they cease from their labor and their works follow them. But, oh, God, there are those that have died who, do, who died without a God on their side. And so, Father God, we're so thankful that you let us stay. Father God, we know that today is a gift. That's why you call it the present. And so, Father God, we thank you for the present. And while we're here this day, help us to make your name glorious. Now, Father, send the word in power, that sharp, powerful, two-edged sword, word that's like a two-edged sword. Send the word, Father God, that goes out of your mouth that will not return to your void, but will accomplish the thing that you said it to do. Father, send the word that you watch over your word 
because to perform it. Send the word, Father God. You said the grass withered, the flower faded, but the word of God stands forever. You said heaven and earth will pass away before one jot or one tittle of your word does not come to pass. Send the word in power. And Father God, in the day that we hear your voice, don't let us harden our heart, but let our answer be yea and amen. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Again, so good to be with you. You've just joined in. I'm Pastor Janet Floyd, and this is a Sunday morning worship service of the New Beginnings Worship Center. So good to have you. We're in the middle of our Advent season. Remember, this is the third Sunday of Advent. Advent season, remember, is the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. And so we're excited about what God is getting ready to do. Right before we go to the Word, let's look at the scripture, Matthew chapter number two, the gospel according to Matthew, the tax collector, the first writer of the synoptic gospels. Matthew is the first of the synoptic gospels. We call them synoptic, of course, because they tell similar stories or they tell the same stories, different perspectives but the same stories. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that's born king of the Jews? For we've seen a star in the east, and we've come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with them. And when he gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judah, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, art not thou the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. I want to share with you just for a second, something good is going to come out of my bad situation. Wherever you are, if you're there with your family, tell your family, say, family, something's good. Something good's coming out of our bad situation. If you're there alone, lift your hands and decree and declare today something good is coming out of our bad situation. As I said, this is Advent season. And remember, we shared with you a couple of Sundays ago, Advent means, amen, expectation. It's a time of hope. In Christian theology, Advent refers to the second coming of Christ. But during this season, Advent means the coming of Christ to earth. It is the expectation of hope, the expectation of something that we never could have expected. It's the expectation of something wonderful. And certainly, as we look at the historical background of Matthew chapter 2, this was perhaps the darkest time, one of the darkest times in Israel's history. That's the magnificent thing about Advent. Advent brought hope. Jesus Christ, the coming of Christ brought hope to a very, very, very dark world. The people of Israel, the children of Israel were experiencing some of their most difficult times. It was a time of instability. It was a time of uncertainty. And that's the magnificent thing about God. God always sends the answer. In the midst, praise God, of the problem. He always sends the solution while the problem seemingly has engulfed us. At the writing of this text, Mary and Joseph, as we know, are preparing now to go to Bethlehem. And there, praise God, at, at, at the writing of chapter 2, chapter 2 deals with once they've arrived in Bethlehem. Remember, the innkeeper says there's no room. God says, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof of the world, and they that dwell therein. But the innkeeper tells the God of the world, there is no room for you. And so Joseph and his young wife, Mary, they're, they're allowed to stay, spend the night in the manger. And something magnificent happens in the midst of the darkest time Israel has ever known. There is being birthed Jesus, the light of the world. In the midst of the times of Roman persecution, as people of color, as African-American people, we can identify with the Israelites. Amen. They were under Roman rule, the discriminatory policies of Roman rule, the, 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 the policy that subjugated them, the, pro, the poverty, the, excuse me, the, the, the policies that relegated them to second class citizenship. We are familiar with them. Wrestling the darkest times of Israel under Roman rule. God sends his son. He says the government shall be upon his shoulder. In a time where the people of Israel are desperately seeking, praise God, amen, light. Desperately seeking the answer, God sends his son. In a time where people are hungry for justice and hungry for equality and hungry for freedom of expression spiritually, God sends Jesus the bread of, the bread of life. And so God steps in. That's what Advent means, if it means anything at all. It is the expectation of something magnificent showing up in the midst of a dark time. And those of us that are living now, certainly we can, we can praise God, relate to the children of Israel. 
Certainly, most of us are living in a time, this time of the coronavirus, living in a time that we never, ever saw in American history, and certainly one we never thought we'd see. We've always known that America has been considered the superpower of the world. We never ever thought that we live a day when we see the greatest medical and scientific minds of America baffled over the cure for the coronavirus. Not just the cure, but even the policies, even even submitting some sort of policy that would enable the disease not to be, praise God, contracted so easily and spread so easily. We never thought that America would seem as though, praise God, we were a third world country simply because of our ignorance in regards to what to do about the coronavirus. We're living in times of instability. Multitudes are sick. Multitudes are dying. The economy is dying. Seemingly, Life as we knew it is dying. We're, we're living in times of uncertainty because we're all asking, when will this be over? Will there be a vaccine? And if a vaccine does come, will, will the side effects outweigh the positive effects of the vaccine? When will things be normal again? We can identify with Israel living in dark days, days of instability, days of uncertainty. But the magnificent thing about God and what I want to share with you just for a few minutes is that God always shows up in the most unlikely places, using the most unlikely people to bring the most unlikely miracle that we could ever imagine. God has chosen as the, as the landscape, God has chosen Bethlehem as the stage to create the greatest drama, the greatest miracle the world has ever known. We understand that Bethlehem, the scripture bears it out, that Bethlehem is considered a very insignificant, small little city, outwardly insignificantly, but obviously spiritually powerful. Remember that Bethlehem is positioned between two great cities, between Jerusalem and Egypt. And Bethlehem is the site, it is the heart of the conflict between Israel and Palestine right now. So right now, that little insignificant piece of land, that little land that's squeezed in between Jerusalem and Egypt is being fought over at this present moment. That is the reason for the conflict, the present conflict in Palestine and Israel. They're fighting over this land. And I want to share something with you the Lord dropped into my spirit. People will always fight over your Bethlehem. People will always fight over the thing in you that can birth the incredible. People will always fight. No one fights over the ordinary, but they'll always fight over the extraordinary. That little piece in you. That's why it's so important that you can identify your self-worth and you can identify what God is going doing in your life and you can identify the gifts God's put in your life because everybody wants a piece of Bethlehem. Everybody wants to get that thing out of you that's going to birth the miraculous. They were fighting over Bethlehem. But, but, but Bethlehem is not the only unlikely place that God has used. You remember God used the widow of Zarephath's house to sustain Elijah. All of the rich people in the world he uses. Praise God, a widow's house to take care of the prophet. And by taking care of the prophet, the widow was blessed. Remember, praise God, he used, amen, uh, the, the river Jordan to heal Naaman. Naaman gets upset. Remember Naaman the leper and says, couldn't you send me someplace else? Why would you send me to such a dirty place. And the slave girl, an unlikely person, the little slave girl says, is it a hard thing that God asked? If he'd asked you a hard thing, you would have done it. And so God always uses unlikely places. And of course he used a cradle and a manger to birth the king of kings. He always uses... I don't care where you're located today. I don't care where your physical position may be. I don't care what job you may be on. Pastor, I don't care how many members you have. I don't care how small the church is. I don't care if you're meeting in a garage or a strip mall or the living room in your house. I want you to know that God is the God that can use unlikely places. I don't care if you start your cake business in the, in the house, praise God, that you're living in. I don't care, praise God, if you start your lawn business on your own grass. Whatever you're doing, no matter how how small? That's why the Bible admonishes us, despise not small beginnings. God is the God that will show up in your unlikely places. I don't care if you're on a job where there's extreme discrimination. I don't care if you're on a job where seemingly your talents are not valued and no one sees, praise God, your innovation, your creativity. I want you to know right where you are, God is in the business of using, and I feel the anointing, most unlikely places to work a miracle. And not only does God use the most unlikely places, God will use the most unlikely people 
thank God for Jesus. And many of us praise him right now because we are the unlikely people that God used. You remember God used Rahab the whore to save Joshua and the spies. Rahab, because of, praise God, her faith, because of her obedience, the whore, that's the business that she was in. Remember when Joshua and the spies came, she would hang out the red tassel to let the men know, hey, hey, I'm ready, come on in. Amen, it was Rahab the whore who saved her family and the children of Israel. Oh God, and now it's Rahab that was in the legacy of Jesus. Remember, it was Ruth the Moabite that led, praise God, Naomi, who had become bitter. And she said, I'm bitter now, my name is Mara, that helped her become Naomi, the pleasant one again. It was Naomi, praise God, that got it, amen, that brought Ruth into connection with Boaz. And now Mo, Ruth the Moabite is in the, the lineage of Jesus Christ. Remember it was, as I said, the slave girl that helped Naaman get, amen, his healing. It was Gideon hiding behind the wine press that Jesus, that God said to him, you mighty man of valor. And remember it was, amen, a little boy and his lunch that God, Jesus used to feed five thousands. A Jewish girl and a Jewish boy to be the parents of God. Surely, God uses the most unlikely people. And God will use the most unlikely people. Let me tell you why he does it. The most unlikely people and the most unlikely places so he can get the glory. You've got to remember, amen, that God's, amen, the end result of everything God does is that God will get the glory. If we're doing anything, preachers, if we're doing anything, evangelists, young people, if we're doing anything that God isn't getting the glory out of, we're doing the wrong thing. God uses the unlikely people. So you can't say it's because of the talent. Remember the Bible says in Corinthians, not many wise men, not many bold men, not many many great men, but God uses the foolish things of the world to compound, or to compound the wise. And so God uses the unlikely people and the unlikely places so he can get the glory. He is the God, praise God. When seemingly our world has fallen down around us, he will give us beauty for ashes. He's a God that gives purpose in our pain. He's a God that gives us healing in the midst of our greatest hurt and deliverance in dire dilemmas. He is the God that uses the most unlikely people and the unlikely places to work a miracle. Why don't you clap your hands and praise him right now? I want you to know it was not in Israel. It was not in Egypt. It was not in, praise God, another marvelous city. It was in Bethlehem. Praise God. The place where people said no one believed. Everybody said it can't nothing good come out of Bethlehem. History makes note of it. Everybody said it. No one believed it. No one thought it. If anyone would have heard it before they saw it, they would have thought it was a joke. They they would have laughed of all the places God would have chose. How could he choose Bethlehem? But as I said, amen, God will use the most insignificant place to make praise God the most significant thing occur. God used Bethlehem to bring to the world the king of glory as we think about this Advent season. And as we think about Bethlehem, those of us that are living in these times can relate. Who would ever believe that anything good could come out of 2020? Everyone I speak to, they're saying, I'll be so glad when the year's over. You know, we're having our countdown 28 days. And so many people say, oh, prophetess, I'm counting it down. I'm so ready for 2020 to be over. I'm so ready for it to come to an end. 2020 is the worst year of my life. Certainly for all of us, it represents confusion and chaos disease and dying. You cannot think about 2020 and not think about loneliness and loss. For many of us, seemingly, this is the worst time we've ever lived in. We may not agree on much, but most of us would agree that 2020 is a horrible year. Most of us would agree that we, if we could, we would take the eraser of time and just erase this whole year. That if we could, if we had the power, we would rewind to 2019 and try to do something different for 2020. Or praise God, even better, we would just fast forward and get past 2020 and get back to what we think is normal. But what you've got to understand, what you've got to shout about is that these are the times that God shows up the greatest. I feel the power of God now. It's during these times, amen, when seemingly we have nothing to shout about that God gives us the greatest reason to shout. It's during these times when seemingly we have 
nothing to dance about that God will put dancing in our feet. Out of our Bethlehem, I thank God today, out of, praise God, 2020, something wonderful can happen. You know, praise God, despite all the people, praise the Lord, that have lost jobs and livelihoods and businesses that shut down. For many of us, for many of us more than ever before, we have known him to be Jehovah Jireh. I thank God, the God that provides. Amen. He's still making a way. You still have your car. You still have your job. Amen. Some kind of way. You know, we say it all the time. It doesn't add up, but we've learned we could count on it. We learned that in 2020. Now, more than ever before, we've said that he was Jehovah Jireh. We said that he provided, but we learned in 2020 that he was Jehovah Jireh, the God that provides. We learned in 2020 that he was Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. And you may say, you know, I have peace, but oh, I tell you, as we sat every morning transfixed, on the TV, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, whatever you look at, as we looked every day at the growing amount, as the numbers just escalating, people that are sick and people that are dying. I had friends that lived in Amen, New York, that were just terrified, were totally, praise God, devastated over the fact that there were not enough places to put the dead bodies, that they were holding dead bodies in meat trucks, in cooler trucks. Certainly, praise God. Amen. No one ever believed that America would experience such. But in the midst of that, we found that he was Jehovah Shalom. He was a God of great peace. In a time of isolation, when, when our loved ones and our sick ones would go to the hospital, we've never in life experienced a time, even if they were in ICU, even if they were in CCU, if they were in the most tragic state, we were able to go in if nothing but, if not for but a minute, a second, you know, time, you can stay with them 30 minutes. We're able to go in to our loved ones and squeeze their hand and whisper to them and say, I want you to know I'm here. We were there to put a little oil on their hands and let them know we're praying. This is the first time in many of our histories that we could not even see our loved ones, but we found them to be Jehovah Shammah, the God that was there. And even though we couldn't go, we found that he's a God. I bless his name right now that we could send him Praise God. And he would be there. We learned this year, more than any year, that he was, amen, and he is Jehovah Shammah, the God that's there. And then we learned, praise God, that he was Jehovah Rapha. Yes, people have gotten sick, and yes, so many people have died, but there are some people that came so close to death. There are some people that were so sick and we watched the hand of God heal them. And that those of us praise God because of the goodness of God. Amen. If we contracted the disease, we haven't had any symptoms. We haven't been sick. Oh, if ever we've learned, I bless him today that he's Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals. We've learned it this year. We've learned, praise God, amen, that he's El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. Some kind of way we still, in the midst of all of the layoff and the downsizing and the loss of jobs and all of praise Praise God, the uncertainty and the, insta and the instability we were faced was some kind of way we still had more than enough money. We still had more than enough joy. Despite all that we've been through, we still have more than enough praise. We found him to be, praise God, God. If ever we knew him, if ever we realized who God was, we realized it this year. That's what the Advent season is all about. We celebrate a king, and that's what I want to encourage you about. A king that came, praise God, in the darkest times of the world's history. A king that used the most unlikely people, a little Jewish girl, an unknown Jewish man. An unlikely place, a cradle in a manger. He brought to the world the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He brought to the world the answer to all of our problems to all of our questions, and the solution to all of our problems. During this Advent season, if any season speaks to us, it speaks to us as God's ability to do the impossible. Certainly, praise God, we see him now. Certainly, you couldn't possibly live this year. You couldn't go through 2020 and not lift your hands and say he's the God of the impossible. You couldn't lift, you, you couldn't say this year. You cannot live through the coronavirus and not say he's a magnificent God. If you've ever had a praise, if you've ever had a shout, if you've ever had a dance, if you've ever had a hallelujah, you got it this year. If you've ever had a testimony, I feel God now, you got it this year. If you ever had a reason to love him, if you ever had a reason to bless him, if you ever had a reason to live for God. Now is the year. Certainly 2020 with all of this pain and all of this hurt and all of its uncertainty and all of its instability and all of it pray, all of its amen, amen, the questions and all of the problems. We learned this year that he's God and that he is God with us. 
And we don't know why he chose you use this year. You know, he could have showed it, showed us that. We could have learned that in 2020, couldn't we have? We could have learned that in 2017. But he chose the darkest hour. A time, praise God, when we're, so many even Christians are asking, is God angry? You, you, no doubt you can imagine what the Israelites felt. Roman persecution, Roman rule, subjugated under discriminatory policies and practices. You know they wondered, has God forgotten? Does God love us? Does God care? You remember it was, it was a pattern of the Jewish people to repent and to go right back in sin, to be forgiven and come back. Just, just a, 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 a circle, a continuum of repentance and remorse, then reconciliation, and then they, they, once again they fail. So certainly you can understand what they're thinking now. Perhaps God is angry. Perhaps we've made God so upset. Perhaps this is the straw that even broke God's back. Perhaps God is through. You've got to imagine what they felt as the Romans came in and demanded of them a tax, demanded that they travel. To, to their cities to pay taxes, to a government that was not reflective of them, and a government that did not want to represent them, that a government that wanted to persecute them and subjugate them. You can imagine, you know what they were feeling. We've offended God for the last time. God didn't care. God's mad. We thought the same thing. All of us have asked preachers, evangelists, pastors, we've all talked together in our offices when our members weren't listening. Is God mad? We've all asked the question, so who sent the coronavirus? Is this because of God? The church was relegated as, as a non-essential entity. We remember in the New Testament when, when Jesus got angry and drove out the, 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 vin, the vendors and the tax collectors in, in the temple and the synagogue and said, you made my house a den of these, but my house is supposed to be a house of prayer. We remember in the New Testament when Jesus shut down church. Is this what happens? To us? Has, has the hand of God shut down church? I know many of us have gone back to church and many of us have ha are having some kind of semblance of church, some kind of downsized church. But we remember when church was closed and those that went contracted viruses. That many of the saints that died, they died because they went to church. They were going to church unbeknownst at that time. Many in praise God during the, the, during the month of March, we did not know. We, the, the government had not informed us that we did not need to gather. And so many of the saints that died, died because they were in church. You've got to imagine. You, you, you can, we can imagine what they felt. We're asking the same questions. Is God angry? Abortion. Same-sex marriages, greed, corruption, separating children from their parents, death, discrimination, racism. Have we offended God so that God is just tired? Is, is God angry? Is he, is he just through? We've all asked that. You could only imagine what they were thinking. That's what they were thinking. And God chose during that time to say, no, not only am I not angry, I am so in love with you that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. During this time when they were wondering, are you angry? God said, I know the thoughts I think toward you. Thoughts of peace, Israel, not of evil to give you an expected end. When they thought that they were not on God's mind, they found out they were on the center of God's mind. That God was preparing the greatest event in eternity. All those of you that are listening this morning, yes, we're in dark times. And yes, many of us have begun to wonder. We've had our theological conversations and arguments. Is God mad? Who sent the coronavirus? Whoever sent it? Praise God. One thing we know, our thoughts are not his thoughts. And our ways are not his ways. I want you to know God told me to tell you that you're on. God's mind. God told me to tell you that he loves you with an everlasting love. God told me to tell you, praise God, that the Advent season means, praise God, it represents people that are waiting in hope, waiting for an answer, praise God, to questions, waiting for a solution to every problem, waiting for that long lost dream, waiting for something to come to pass, waiting for the marriage, waiting for the business, waiting for the healing. 
Advent represents a season of waiting, but not a season of waiting and no realization. Not, not a season of waiting listlessly, waiting, praise God, just, amen, speaking, praise God, things into the air. But it, amen, it doesn't just, praise God, denote a season of waiting. It, it denotes a season of receiving. Israel had longed for a king. The king did not come the way. He didn't come in the place that they thought. The king was born in a manger. They wanted a king and they got a baby, but they got what they've been praying for. I want you to know today that you're going to get these next 28 days of the year, you're going to get what you've been praying for. Remember, it may not come in the package. Are you listening to me? It may not come in the package that you expect, but oh, it's coming. It may not come in the place that you expect. It may not be in the person you expect, but I want you to know today, if you've ever believed anything I see, I've said, and anything I said that I see, I want you to know today that something's coming. What you have been waiting for. Don't miss it because it doesn't come in the person that you wanted to come in. Don't miss it because it doesn't come in the place that you wanted in. Don't miss it if you don't understand what God's doing. I want you to know that Advent represents a season that God, praise God, he said, I'll give you a son and his name will be Emmanuel and that means God is with us. I want to tell you this Sunday morning that God is with us in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your loss, in the midst, praise God, or your financial, praise God, difficulties, in the midst of your confusion, in the midst of your loneliness, I want you to know God is with us and something magnificent is going to show up in the Bethlehem of your heart. What is it that you are believing God for? What are you expecting? What are you hoping for? It's Advent season. Something magnificent is on the way. It's Advent. Raise your level of expectation. It's Advent. What you've been waiting for all of your life. There's a life-changing event that occurred when Jesus Christ came to earth. And because the Savior came, because Jesus lives, you are, praise God, amen, a recipient of, amen, something magnificent. What are you believing God for? What are you hoping for? What are you praying about? What have you, like the children of Israel, what have you been waiting for? You said, prophetess, I've been waiting for this for years. What is it? I want you to know, in the midst of your bad situation, something good is getting ready to come out of it. In the midst of your pain, something miraculous is on the way. I want you to know, in your Bethlehem, in the most unlikely place, hear me now, I feel God. God's going to do something. It's going to come from the most unlikely person, the person that you thought had never looked at you, the person that, I mean, you never thought you were even on his mind. You never thought that she'd give you the time of day. You never thought that you even made an impression. A person, praise God, that you would have never thought in a million years there's a miracle in their hands for you. It's going to happen right where you are. You all, it's Advent season. I want you to know that something good is coming out of your bad situation. I don't care how bad it is. I don't care how much it hurts. I don't care, praise God, if you say prophetess, I don't see how that's going to happen. That's what the Israelites said. They said, I don't see how that's going to happen. How could possibly anything good come out of Bethlehem? It can't be. There cannot be a king, praise God. If he's a king, certainly he'd have a place. Praise God, he'd be born in a palace. If he was a king, certainly, praise God, his mother would not have been an insignificant Jewish girl, amen, and a Jewish carpenter. If he's a king, certainly, praise God, amen, he could have afforded a place to lay his hand. But oh, I want you to know from that manger, amen, came the king. From praise God, the womb, praise God, I thank God today, of an unknown Jewish girl came the answer to the world. And I want you to know, amen, your answer, praise God, the, the Bethlehem in your spirit, it's getting ready to bring forth something that's going to change your life. I feel God now, the Bethlehem of your life, the insignificant place, amen, the place, praise God, it means you thought nothing would ever happen. There's not anything good that could come out of this place. God sent me to tell you today something good's coming out of your bad situation. Get ready for it. Believe God for it. Expect to prepare for it. I feel God right now. Oh God, because you're getting ready to give birth to something that's going to change your mind. Something good is coming out of your bad situation. Oh, why don't you clap your hands and praise God right now. I feel God. I'm so thankful. Amen. I pray that you're encouraged. Amen. These next few days of the year, I want you to look for it now. I want you to expect it. Something good is on the way. I've got to go and I know you do too, but I feel the urgency, the unction in my spirit to tell you, expect it. Stop saying he couldn't do it for 
you. Stop saying he wouldn't use you. He will use you because God wants to get the glory. And that's the only thing you've got to do. You've got to promise God that, oh, God, when you do it, praise God, I'll give you the glory. You know what? When people look at you, praise God, they're going to give God the glory because they're going to say, I never thought God would use her that way. I never thought God would do that for him. I never thought they'd have that kind of life. They live in that kind of house. They'd have that kind of ministry. She'd reach, praise God, that level of notoriety. I never thought, praise God, their business would do that well. I never thought the church would grow like this. I never thought anything could come. You know, their mama wasn't nothing and their father wasn't nothing. They grew up in the projects, but look now they own them. Oh, I want you to know, y'all, I'm trying to quit, but I feel God now. Something magnificent. Something in the old heart. Something come I see something good. I dare you to dry your tears. I dare you, praise God, amen, to lift your faith today. Something good is coming out of your bad situation. Clap your hands and praise him right now. Great God of the Bible, we love you and we thank you for the power of the word. And God, we believe God this morning, something good. Oh God, praise the Lord. Out of our Bethlehem, out of our small place, our insignificant areas. Father God, something magnificent is coming out of us. Father God, people have looked and said, you're not going to be this. You're has been. You'll never be. You won't have. But oh God, we thank you today. Advent means the impossible is coming to pass. We thank you in advance. And Father God, we want you to get the glory. When people in the old sea, when people look at our lives, we promise you this morning, we won't say it's what we know or who we know or what we have or who we're married to or what school we've been to. But oh, when they look at us, we'll lift our hands and cry to God be the glory. Oh God, we were created to make your name glorious. And that's what we want to do. That that's what Advent's all about. Oh, God, that you will use the most unlikely places and people to work a miracle. Something good can come out of bad situations. And we love you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. So good to be with you this morning. I thank God for you. I pray that you were blessed. I could have went on and on. Oh, something good. Something good is getting ready to come out of it. Listen, it's offering time right now. Just clap your hands and praise God again, new beginnings. Thank you for being so faithful with your seed. I appreciate you. God will not forget your labor of love. And remember, praise God. He said that if you give God that dime, he'd open a window of heaven and pour you out a blessing. You wouldn't have room enough to receive. And then the Bible said he rebuked the devourer. <clears throat> for your sake, you know, that's a whole lot for a dime. So you're getting your tithes in your hand, new beginnings, because we pay our tithes when we get our tithes. For those of you, praise God, that want to sow, we're good seed to sow. I want you to sow $28. That's what God said. You said, oh, we've sown $28. I dare you to do it. Amen. Under, uh, out of something so unlikely. So you think in order to get a great miracle, you got to sow a thousand and twenty-eight or two twenty-eight or two thousand twenty-eight. No, God will use, praise God, something as unlikely, something as insignificant as twenty-eight dollars. You cannot feed a family of four at Pizza Hut with twenty-eight dollars. You cannot feed a family of four at Burger at Burger King at Popeyes or churches for twenty-eight dollars. Oh, you got to know today, God. God doesn't need your twenty-eight dollars. God's moved by your obedience. Everything you need is attached to a seed. Everything you need is attached to some seed. It's not always the magnitude of the seed. It is the obedience attached to it. It is the faith attached to it. I want everyone under the sound of my voice. So that 28. <clears throat> you know, he's been saying all, all along this year, amen, 28. Two means it's shortly going to come to pass. Eight means new beginning. Isn't that what you need? Don't you need a new beginning? Don't you need something wonderful and new to come to pass? That's what God is getting ready to do for you. I want you to believe God. Everyone that will, remember God talked about five times. I want you to sow it five times. Those of you that can. You say, I can give so much more than 28. I want you to find five people and I want you to attach it. But what I want you to attach the seed today is your unlikely request. The thing that you thought was most unlikely to happen for you. The things, praise God, that you thought, that people thought was unlikely to happen to you. I want you to attach the thing, the unlikely thing that you want God to happen for you and the unlikely person you want God to touch. There's two things I want you to attach to the seed. Remember, we give our seed assignment. The unlikely miracle. What is the thing that people never thought, you never thought, could happen for you? I want you to attach it to that $28 seed. And who is the unlikely person? It may be you, and if it is, just say, me. But you may have a brother, a sister, a cousin, someone in the church that's going through, that's in jail, that's still lost. 
And people have said, God is never going to change Change them. They're never going to change. I want you to attach them. Some, an unlikely miracle is going to come out of the seed. I want you to believe God today. Remember, we have three ways you can give. You can give Giblify. That's Janet Floyd Ministries. You can give PayPal, Janet Floyd Media at gmail.com. And you can give Venmo, Janet Floyd Media. Sow your seed today. Again, I feel an unction to tell you the unlikely blessing that you want. The thing that you've said in your heart. The Bible said when the angels came to Sarah in the tent, the angel said, you're going to give, a ch- give, give birth to a child. And the Bible said, Sarah laughed. What is the thing in your life that you've laughed about? The thing that you said, right, sure, uh-huh. I want you to attach that to your $28 seed. Who is the person that everybody has wrote off? He's never going to be nothing. She, she don't want to have anything. She's nobody. They'll always be in jail. They'll always be in drugs. They'll always be in that. They'll never get ahead. Who is that person? And if that person has been you, attach you. Your unlikely desire, your your unlikely miracle, and your unlikely person, attach it to that seed. Lift up your seed quickly. Even everyone that will, everyone of the sound of my voice, every single person that hears me, if you've ever believed anything I said, do not hear this today. And not so. Don't hear it today. If you have to ask somebody, if you have to ask 10 people to give you $2.80, if you have to ask people, I want you to show everyone that will believe God an unlikely miracle. Something you've said, it's not going to happen. Something you've laughed at like Sarah, right? And an unlikely person. Lift it up and say, this is my offering. This is my tithe that leaves my hand. But it doesn't leave my life. It goes to my future to accomplish the thing that I needed to accomplish. Because of this tithe, because of this offering, my family, my whole family, they're blessed, they're saved, and they're living for God. Because of my tithe and my offerings, my family lives in the overflow. We have so much money, we can sow and sow and sow. We have more houses than we can live in. We have more, we have rental property, and we have more cars than we can drive. Because of my offering, my unlikely blessing, the thing that I thought would never happen for me is going to happen. Happen. And the thing people said, and the peop- the person people said it could never happen for, it's going to happen for them. Because of my tithes and my offerings, the church is blessed. People wait in line to get in our church. Our church impacts the city, the state, the nation, and the world for Christ. Because of my tithes, the doors of debt, the doors of disease, the doors of depression, the doors of divorce, the doors of distraction are shut. And the doors of wealth and health and Power and anointing and miracles are open. It is so, and it will not be otherwise. We decree and declare. Remember, attach your seed, everybody. Amen. Some of you have family members that you need to call and say, listen, <coughs> just give me $28. I want to sort it for you. Tell your mother, tell your cousin, tell your aunt. Amen. Amen. Some of you need to sort from those five people. Whatever it is, sow that seed for your unlikely miracle. <laughs> And for your unlikely person. Don't forget tomorrow morning, Millennial Monday. Come on, Millennials, get up and let's pray. Don't forget Bible study at 5.15 and the 28 days of decision. We're counting down, praise God. I will be with you. I've talked to you today. I'll be with you Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Every day of the week, I'll be with you until the first of the year. Listen, it's been magnificent to talk to you. Something good is coming out of your bad situation. Tell somebody that today. Email to them. Tell them, praise God. Text, email to somebody. There's an unlikely miracle on the way. I feel God. There's an unlikely breakthrough. It's totally unlikely that it could happen this year. It's totally unlikely that you would ever have it. Tell someone it's happening. Be blessed. Be encouraged. Be strengthened. If no one's told you yet that they love you, if no one's told you that they care, know that Prophet Floyd, Pastor Floyd does love you. I do care. Have an incredible God first day. And I'll talk to you in the morning. Bye-bye.